All right, good deal. Um, if you don't mind to mute your microphones, everyone, and Dr. Davis will begin uh, recording this so he can post it on YouTube. But I want to start us off with a word of prayer. Uh, let's pray together. God, I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to uh, study the Bible with uh, my friends and family over uh, over this, this project. God, I pray that uh, I would speak clearly, I would speak courageously, and that I would represent your word well and that um, even as we look at a difficult text god i pray that um, our eyes would ultimately be on you and the glory of christ in this passage and that we wouldn't get um, caught in the weeds but that um, our goal in in every every instance that we open the bible would just be to to stare at the the majesty of your word and the glory of your gospel and i pray that um, this presentation would accomplish that and it would it would go for your glory in your name i pray amen so my uh, senior thesis project is called This is a Strange Text, the study of 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. And I decided um, to do my project on 1 Peter chapter 3 when um, as a student ministry, I, I, I help lead and, and teach in the student ministry at my church. We were deciding what book of the Bible we wanted to preach through to our students this semester. And we decided to, to go through 1 Peter. And I was I spent some time going through First Peter and was just kind of getting familiar with the text, even though I'd, I'd read it before. But I wanted to familiarize myself, especially with uh, the parts that I would be teaching on. And one of the one of the sections that I was supposed to teach on was chapter three, eighteen through twenty two. And when I saw that chapter, when I paid close attention to it, I was like, "What on earth is going on here? I don't know uh, what Peter's saying here, and I don't, I especially don't know how I would explain this to my students." So I decided to. To start pouring myself into some research on this passage and try to try to find the the most compelling interpretation of it, so that I could share um, with the students at church. And I, I started doing so much research and, and and reading that I thought I might as well just make this my thesis project because I had uh, mountains of of information that I collected. So that's that's what I want to do for this this presentation. I want to take a look at the research that I put together on First Peter chapter three verses 18 through 22. And I want to take a look at a lot of uh, the different views that people have on the passage, some of the some of the different difficult issues that are that have been raised by Peter here. And uh, but ultimately, I want to I want to compile a statement on what we can know for sure on this passage, what Peter what what's the main truth that Peter's trying to communicate. And I, I wound up with this thesis statements. Um, the message of 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22 is that the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ has made him victorious over the powers of evil and suffering. That That's the truth that Peter's communicating here, despite the difficult language and despite the, the trouble that we have interpreting the passage. Ultimately, um, that's the truth that, that Peter is proclaiming, that Christ is the victor and his His death, resurrection, and ascension has, has made him victorious over over the powers of evil in the universe. So before we um, get into it, I want to read the passage for us. You should be able to see it on your screen, but I'll just read that really quickly. Uh, it says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to, corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. As you can see, I've highlighted several confusing phrases in this passage. You know, if, if, you, if you heard me read that passage and said to yourself, I don't know what's going on there. You're, you're not alone. Um, there's there's lots of confusing language in that passage. Um, you know, where is Jesus going? Um, who are the spirits in, in prison that he's proclaiming to? What is he saying to them? Um, in what sense is, is baptism salvific? In verse 21, it says baptism now saves you. So there are a lot of a lot of tricky questions and topics that this, this passage raises. And I, I wanted to take a look at it. And uh, you and I are not alone in and seeing the difficulty in this passage, uh, many, many great theologians and Bible scholars have, have been rather stumped by uh, what's going on here in this text. Uh, Martin Luther 
um, which this, this quote's where I got my title from, Martin Luther in his commentary on First Peter. He says, this is a strange text and a more obscure passage, perhaps, than any other in the New Testament. For I do not certainly know what it, it is that St. Peter means. Um, a more contemporary scholar, uh, Curtis Vaughn, he was a former prophet, Southwestern. He said in his commentary, uh, this short passage without question presents the most perplexing as exegetical problems of the entire epistle and perhaps of the whole New Testament. So you, you and I are not alone in being confused by this passage. There's a lot of difficult things going on here. But what I wanted to do in this presentation, I can't get into the details that I got into in my paper, but I wanted to just kind of break this uh, passage down clause by clause, section by section, and just kind of answer some of the maybe the difficult questions that are there and maybe raise some some new questions. But but overall, just kind of try to get a sense of, of what Peter is conveying in this passage. So uh, the first first section I want to want to look look over for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Uh, now, what does it mean that Christ suffered once for sins? The word translated suffered there in that passage is epithen. Um, this this word, it's almost always translated suffering, but it appears more in First Peter than it does in any other book in the New Testament. I think it has 12 appearances in First Peter, which is more than double um, any other book has. So suffering in general plays a significant role in, in First Peter. It's, it's kind of a theme of the epistle. And in verse 3, 318, uh, Peter is proclaiming Christ as uh, the righteous sufferer. Christ suffered for sins. There is a textual variant in this passage, uh, apathonin, um, which is, is translated Christ died. Um, and there's some there's some discrepancy in the, the ancient manuscripts over which one should be preferred. But due to the prevalence of, of suffering in, in First Peter, as well as um, the oldest manuscripts containing the word epithen, I, I, I would prefer this passage be translated Christ suffered. But it really it really doesn't matter a whole lot because both Christ's suffering and Christ's death are kind of tied together at at the cross, at his crucifixion, the and the suffering of Jesus is is bound to the crucifixion. So Peter, uh, Peter here is trying to uh, cast his reader's gaze on on Gal Golgotha, where um, Christ suffered as an innocent man on behalf of of sinful people in order to to make them right with God. The purpose of Christ's suffering and death on the cross was to atone for the sins of his people. That's um, that's what, what Peter means by saying that Christ suffered for sins. He's connecting the suffering of Christ back to the Levitical um, sacrifices of atonement um, in the Old Testament, where the high priest would, would sacrifice an animal on behalf of uh, the sins of the people in order that their sins might be atoned for. Here, Peter is portraying Christ as both a greater high priest and a greater sacrifice. Uh, Christ willingly offered himself as an atoning sacrifice uh, for sins in his his sacrifice was effectual. He only had to do it one time because he was the perfect sacrifice and he sacrificed himself willingly. The cross reference for this um, is Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 27. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, and separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. The purpose of Christ's sacrifice on the cross was that he might bring us to God. Peter presents uh, his readers as exiles that are lost in this world until um, they're brought back home to, to heaven, to God, their father. And Peter, Peter is presenting here the way that Christ brings us back to God. I love this quote from, from Peter Davids. He says, Jesus died in order that he might reach across the gulf between God and humanity and taking our hand, lead us across the territory of the enemy into the presence of the father who called us. The last part of chapter three, verse 18, Christ uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit here. Here, Peter is presenting a contrast between being put to death in the flesh and being made alive in the spirit. Um, there's, uh, I put these phrases side by side so you can kind of see the contrast. Uh, thanatothes and zopoiethes. Dr. Davis can help me uh, pronounce those correctly, but um, those are both aorist active participles. 
Um, you can translate those having been put to death and having been made alive, respectively. Um, and sarki and pneumati or pneumati are flesh, flesh and spirit. Those are both datives, which can perform a, a variety of functions. But but what Peter's laying out here is that he, he's drawing a contrast between the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was crucified and he was put to death in his flesh or in, in terms of his body. But after his death, he was made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, acted as the agents who, who resurrected Jesus. Most, most scholars that I read um, thought that we should interpret spirit there to be meaning the, the Holy Spirit, the person, the person of the Holy Spirit who resurrected Jesus from the dead. And that's why you'll see in versions like the Christian Standard Bible and the the NIV, they, they choose to capitalize spirit in verse 18 to show that it is the Holy Spirit who's bringing Jesus alive from the dead, despite um, his crucifixion. Uh, Tom Schreiner sum, summarizes the message of verse 18 well, and you'll see me quoting from, from Schreiner quite a bit. His commentary was really helpful for me in this project. He says, even though Jesus suffered death in terms of his body, the spirit raised him from the dead. Similarly, those who belong to Christ, even though they will face suffering, will ultimately share in Christ's resurrection. The message of 1 Peter um, 3.18 is that Christ died and he rose to atone for sin and provide a means of escape for, for his people from, from death, they, that they might uh, resurrect along with Christ in the future. Now, verse 19 is where it starts to get uh, a little more tricky. And before I, I get into um, what's going on in verse 19 and 20, I want to present a few views on what's happening here in this passage. Um, these views aren't comprehensive by any means, but most people that I read generally fell into one of these, these four categories. So I'm going to um, present these, these four views on verses 19 and 20 real quick before I start breaking down those verses. There's the view of the evangelistic descent. Um, this view believes that verse 19 and 20 is referring to Jesus descending into hell. Um, the, the hell, the, in this place of spiritual torment and one while he's in hell he preaches the gospel to those who are suffering in hell he preaches uh, a second chance for salvation if you will to those that are, are suffering in hell and this this view was was very popular among the church fathers those who uh, were first interacting with first peter chapter three um, this quote from cyril of alexandria sums this up Really well, he paints a pretty vivid picture of, of what's going on here, according to the evangelistic descent. He says, going in his soul, he preached to those who were in hell, appearing to them as one soul to other souls. When the gatekeepers of hell saw him, they fled. The bronze gates were broken open and the iron chains were undone. And the only begotten son shouted with authority to the suffering souls, according to the word of the new covenant, saying to those in chains, come out and to those in darkness, be enlightened. He preached to those who were in hell so that he might save all those who would believe in him. He was able to liberate those in hell who believed and acknowledged him by his descent there. However, those who were blinded by fleshly lust did not have the power to see him, and they were not delivered. Uh, second view, very similar to the first, is I I'm calling it the victorious descent. Um, this is similar in the sense that Christ is performing a, a, a descent in verse 19 in between his death in resurrection. But what's different about this one is that Jesus is not descending to hell per se, but he's actually descending to um, just the realm of the dead called uh, Sheol or, or Hades, both in the Old and New Testament. So Christ is descending to the dead and he's not offering salvation, but he's, he's visiting the righteous saints, those who died um, in the Old Testament, who, who, who died as, as righteous followers of, of God. And he's proclaiming his victory over sin and death. He's, he's telling them that he atoned for sin and he's about to, to rise from the grave and he's going to bring them out with him once he resurrects. Um, Jesus descended to the, the realm of the dead and proclaimed his victory over sin and death to, his, to its inhabitants. Uh, Emerson, Matthew Emerson is a scholar that really helps me understand what's going on here in this view. He's, he's a a modern guy, and he, he just wrote a book this past year called He He Descended to the Dead, an Evangelical Theology of Holy Saturday. And, and you're kind of seeing people like Emerson try to try to bring this view back or kind of a doctrine of descent. 
because um, because of its prevalence in the creeds, like the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed. And so he's, he's trying to uh, trying to help us, help modern evangelicals have a better understanding of what the creedal fathers were uh, were, were talking about when they when they referred to a descent. And this view is is common among Lutherans and Anglicans, especially today. But what I find ironic is that Martin Luther didn't actually think that First Peter chapter three was referring to the descent of Christ. He, he held to another interpretation. So um, Matthew Emerson really pains to make this this point in his book. That First uh, Peter three is not the only text that you can look to for to the doctrine of the descent. He says First Peter three eighteen through twenty two is certainly not the only biblical passage or exegetical argument used to used to support the descent. Nor is it in many cases the crux of a theologian's argument for the doctrine. And he points out that the earliest church fathers who um, were were talking about a descent of Christ they weren't pointing to First Peter chapter three until um, the third century, and so. There are other texts that you can look to for this this doctrine, but um, many people still do look to First Peter three as an evidence for the doctrine of the descent. Um, third view that I'm going to describe is the victorious ascent, and the difference between this and the second one is that it's not talking about, or they they don't believe that First Peter three is referring to um, a descent of Christ in between his crucifixion and resurrection, but it's talking about a ascent of Christ, the ascent of Christ into heaven after his resurrection. And this, this seems to be where most of the current scholars that I was reading, that's, that's where they uh, were landing. So Jesus ascended to the heavens and proclaimed judgment upon the imprisoned sinful angels. They're the, the, the fallen angels. Uh, this oftentimes in this view, the, the modern scholars are, uh, referring back to the tradition of of Enoch, the the pseudepigraphal book, where he he uh, describes uh, the the old saint Enoch from from Genesis chapter four or five, and he's he's going on this journey into the heavens, and on his way into the heavens, he he's proclaiming um, the future judgment upon the fallen angels that that sinned in in Genesis chapter six, and so these these modern scholars think that Peter is picking up on that, and he's saying that that Jesus, like like Enoch in the past, is going into heaven in his ascension and kind of on his way to the right hand of God. He's pronouncing judgment upon these angels that are, are held in prison there. So that's, that's one view. Um, John Eliot lays this out really well. He says, these spirits were imprisoned not below the earth, but above the earth in the heavenly realms. Thus the image is that Christ, as he was raised to life and passed through the heavens in order to be exalted at God's right hand, announce the perpetual condemnation of these spirits and their subordination to him. Uh, last view that I'm going to talk about, and a lot of my favorite theologians actually um, landed somewhere in this camp, but it's the view that um, Christ was preaching through Noah, that, that verse 19 and 20 is, is talking about the spirit of Christ not going anywhere per se, but the spirit of Christ back in time being active in the preaching of Noah to the the wicked men of his generation. Uh, Augustine was the first church father to, to popular, popularize this view. Um, he, he held to a version of Christ preaching through Noah. So, so this is a pretty common one today. Um, R. Scott Clark, he, he provides a summary of, of this view here. He says, Peter says exactly to whom and when Jesus preached. He preached through the spirit then as he does now. He preached to disobedient reprobates through his minister, Noah, the preacher of righteousness, as he does now through Peter. So those, those are, are quick summaries of uh, the four views that I, that I encountered when studying this passage. But now, now I want to break down uh, the text a little bit. That first phrase, in which, or, or it can actually be um, translated in whom, because um, this is a data phrase, and it's referring back to the Holy Spirit who made Jesus alive in verse Verse eighteen. So, um, the the who here is is the, sp the the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, who's uh, resurrecting Jesus from the dead. He's also the agent who is empowering Jesus to rise into the heavens and to make his proclamation to uh, the the fallen angels. Here, if you subscribe to the victorious ascent view, um, the word for he went parathes is. Uh, 
actually used in verses 19 and 22. So a lot of a lot of scholars think that there's a connection there between Christ traveling in verse 19 and Christ ascending into the heavens in verse 22, because um, Jesus, who has gone into heaven, is a is a clear reference to the ascent in verse 22. So a lot of a lot of scholars connect that back to what what Jesus is doing in verse 19, and that's where victorious ascent scholars uh, find that that Jesus is going in verse 19 into the heavens, and then he's kind of completing that mission of ascension in verse 22. This, this is a really weird part where Jesus proclaimed to the spirits in prison. What on earth is going on there? Uh, the word for proclaimed here in Greek, keruso, can be translated he preached or he proclaimed. It almost always in the New Testament is in reference to the preaching of the gospel, like Jesus in the gospels proclaiming the, the coming of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is now here, that, that type of proclamation. The biblical theological lexicon of the of new testament greek says that keruso is the standing expression for the proclamation of a divine message of salvation so this this is usually a phrase referring to the preaching of the gospel however there are a few instances in the new testament where this phrase is neutral it's not referring to um the proclamation or preaching of the gospel but just rather like a neutral proclamation uh in the general sense now, in First Peter, uh, this this is the only time that K. Russo occurs in either of Peter's letters, so it's not clear how Peter employs this word in his letters, and it's not really clear in the context of this passage um, whether he's he's referring to a, a preaching of the gospel or just a more generic sense of preaching. But I do find it interesting that in chapter four, verse six, um, just a, a few verses later, Peter uses the word that we get evangelized from when he's he's describing the gospel having been preached um to people and so um if it seems like if peter wanted to express a preaching of the gospel in 319 he would have used the same word that he used in 4 6 to um, describe the evangelism uh to to the the dead saints and so um, that's an interesting discrepancy there the spirits in prison there's a ton of debate on on who these spirits actually are and where their prison is. Uh, the word pneuma, uh, the word for spirit, has a variety of meanings in the New Testament. It can refer to human spirits, it can refer to angelic beings, or can refer to the Holy Spirit like we see, um, like we saw on verse 18. So it, it can it can occupy any one of those meanings. However, um, when you find the word pneuma in a plural form like you do in verse 19, it's usually referring to non-human spiritual beings in the New Testament. And like scholars like Peter Davids point out, um, spirits in the New Testament, when it's in plural, it always refers to non-human spiritual beings unless it's qualified, unless the context makes it uh, super clear that, that they're not spiritual beings, but they're actually human beings or the spirits of humans. Now, phalake is the, the word commonly translated prison. You see that um, you see that word used in Acts when you know when the apostles are, are thrown in prison. That, that word phalake is what's used there. But you never see pneuma and phalake used together in the New Testament. You only see it two times, uh, once in 1 Peter 3.19 and the other instance in Revelation 18.2. Revelation 18.2 says, And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt or a prison. For every unclean spirit. So in that instance, the only other instance that it's used, you have um, the spirits in prison clearly referring to spiritual beings, demonic beings. And so um, with that being the only other witness of, of the New Testament with these two words together, it's likely that the the spirits in prison that in First Peter 3 is also referring to spiritual beings in prison, not necessarily human spirits that are that are kept in prisons. There's also a possible connection between the spirits in prison in verse 19 and 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude verse 6. Um, and both of these are verses describing um, the fallen, sinful, angelic beings being uh, kept in a prison of sense until their, their judgment in the future. These verses say, um, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And then Jude 6 says, 
and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day and and obviously you know a, a lot of scholars believe that that peter wrote first peter and second peter and so um there could be continuity there between uh, the the prison he's describing in first peter 3 and the the chains of angels that he's describing in second peter 2 and second peter and Jude are, are known to interact together a lot and both potentially draw on on similar sources and so um there's there's the the possibility that peter is connecting the spirits in prison back to um this this chain chaining of the angels until their future judgment that that jude and second peter are referring to next verse 20 uh, because they formerly did not obey when god's patience waited in the days of noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through water um let me see here now this this verse is describing the time and the place that um the spirits were living in and when they were put in prison these these spirits that the verse 19 is describing they are now in prison like verse 20 says because of their sins in the days of noah now people like wayne grudem will say that because these spirit these spirits are, are seemingly in prison because they were sinning or disobeying in the days of noah that implies that the spirits in verse 19 are actually human spirits they were human beings that that disobeyed and now they're they're they've been put in spiritual prison because of the disobedience uh, but that's not necessarily the case uh thomas schreiner points out that um there were angels fallen angels in genesis chapter 6 that were also sinning by having sexual relations with human women or potentially in the time in the time of noah and both of these uh the sins of the angels and the sins of human beings could have coincided with one another and potentially the sins of the angels could have even influenced the rebellious nature of the human beings in noah's day so the disobedience might not necessarily be referring to humans but might could also include angels who were disobeying in noah's day now the quote says um, some might object that god's patience toward humans eliminates any reference to angels but we need to recall that the angels sinned with human beings so that the fate of human beings and angels becomes entangled in the one event it is also likely that Peter reflected on God's patience toward the angels as well, for there is no evidence that God immediately judged the angels for their sin. He allowed them to commit sin with women, and it seems that some time elapsed before he responded in judgment. So you could read that either way. You could read it as human beings disobeying in the time of Noah, or you could include the angelic sin happening in the time of Noah. So now, now that we've covered just a little bit of what is going on in verses 19 and 20, I want to provide a quick uh, evaluation of the different views and and tell you guys which ones I'd find most compelling in relation to the passage. Uh, the evangelistic descent um, is not one that I find very compelling or as a very compelling interpretation of what's going on in 19 and 20 uh, for a few major reasons. Uh, first, um, if Christ went to hell after his death, a lot of people that subscribe to this view imply that Christ continued suffering as he went to hell, as the suffering was part of the punishment that he experienced on our behalf. But um, that is contrary to the, the witness of the Gospels and Christ saying that on the cross it is finished. And it's also contrary to what Peter says just a verse earlier in 318. He says Christ suffered once for sins on the cross and so to to imply that christ continued suffering in hell along with these uh sinful people um does not match with the witness of peter or the rest of the new testament also um there's no there's no biblical warrant for interpreting spirits in prison as meaning people in hell like the spirits in plural is usually a reference to spiritual beings not the spirits of humans and there's no um there's har there's hardly any witness in the bible to associate the term prison here with um the place of hell or the the greek word gehenna that's used in the new testament so those likely are not the same place and also um the the view that christ is potentially offering a second chance of salvation or a post-mortem offer of salvation um to the people in hell makes no con no sense within the context of first peter first peter's whole point as an epistle is to encourage these 
struggling believers to persevere and maintain their faith based on their hope in a future resurrection. He's, he's telling them that their life right here matters. The decisions that they make and their faithfulness to Christ right now matters. And so um, for Christ to then go into hell and offer salvation to people who disregarded Christ in their lives seems to conflict with the entire point of Peter's epistle. Schreiner explains that point like this. He says, it makes no sense contextually for Peter be, to be teaching that the wicked have a second chance in a letter in which he exhorted the righteous to persevere and to endure suffering. Indeed, we have seen in many places throughout the commentary that eternal life is conditioned upon such perseverance. All motivation to endure would vanish if Peter now offered a second opportunity after death. The benefit of braving, braving suffering is difficult to grasp if another opportunity to respond will be offered at death. So it's, it's hard to imagine that Peter is referring to an evangelistic descent of Christ's here if, if Christ is offering salvation to those who are uh, being punished in hell. Uh, next view I want to evaluate is the victorious descent. And this is actually the view that I held going into this paper. I, I assumed that um, 1 Peter chapter 3, 19 was referring to um, the descent of Christ into, into Hades. Um, there is compelling biblical and historical witness for a doctrine of the descent. Like uh, people like Matthew Emerson talk about, there's a, there's a heavy creedal presence of the doctrine of the descent. And there are other passages in the Bible that you can point to and um, use for support of the doctrine of this descent. However, there are a couple problems in 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20 that make uh, a doctrine of the descent unlikely here. It seems like um, chapter 3, 19 is pointing to Christ's proclamation taking place after Jesus was made alive by the Spirit. If, if made alive by the Spirit is referring to the resurrection of Jesus, then that seems to discount the fact that Jesus or, would have descended to the dead and proclaimed in between his death and resurrection because in verse 18, being made alive by the Spirit happens before the, the proclamation takes place. And if, if Jesus' soul is just leaving his body and descending to the dead, then that doesn't really make any sense of made alive either, because in that sense, Jesus' spirit isn't being made alive, but his spirit is just leaving his, his body and is entering the realm of the dead. And also for those who subscribe to the victorious descent, they usually... Um, they usually in, interpret um, these passages to to mean that that Christ is bringing the the faithful saints out of the dead with him when he resurrects and he's, he's leading them into heaven. But um, in First Peter three nineteen and twenty, it seems like these spirits that Christ preached to are sinful; they're disobedient; they don't they don't know God, and so that doesn't seem like it would account for for these people being righteous saints. Uh, the third view, Christ preaching through Noah, the, the view that many of my uh, favorite theologians hold. This view has um, some considerable warrant to it, I think. I think it fits well within the context of First Peter, especially since um, you know Peter could look back to the story of Noah and, and say Noah was um, a part of a very small, righteous minority in the midst of um, a hostile, sinful people around him. And you guys in your in your current situation are like Noah and his family believers surrounded by uh, many hostile pagan unbelievers and so there there is some fit there within the context of first peter and first peter 1 does talk about um Christ spirit uh being active in the in the proclamation of the prophets and the prophets foreshadowing foreshadowing the coming of Christ and so um that it could be what peter's talking about with Noah however it is it does seem like the interpretation of, of Christ preaching through Noah fits pretty oddly within the sequence of first Peter three, 18 through 22 to say that uh, Jesus suffered and died. And then he resurrected and then to, to make that leap all the way back to, uh, to Genesis six and say that um, Peter's referring to Christ, the this presence of the spirit of Christ in the preaching of Noah is seems like a, a pretty large leap. And then to work all the way back to the ascension of Christ in verse um, 22, 22 it just seems to interrupt Peter's flow of thought if he's describing the step-by-step -step process in which we become right with God. This view also doesn't really give an explanation for uh, he went in verse 19 because if Christ's spirit is present 
in the preaching of Noah, if that's what Peter's talking about, then there's really no use for saying that Christ, the, the spirit of Christ went anywhere because uh, Christ's spirit was already present in the past through the ministry of Noah. And as we looked at a little bit, spirits in prison is, is unlikely referring to human beings um, just because spirits in the plural form is, is not very often referring to human spirits. And there's, there's no, no evidence in the new Testament for human spirits being, being kept in prison. So um, I don't think that's what Peter's talking about in this passage either. I, th- I think that the victorious ascent position is the most compelling here that, that verse 19 is actually talking about the ascension of Christ. And as he ascends into heaven, he's proclaiming to the, the evil spirits that, that he's won the victory and that they will, um, they will continue to be, be changed, chained to a, a future judgment. Um, I think that, that this view makes the most sense of the sequence going on in, in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. It's simply describing the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, the, the triad of Christ's redemptive work. I think this view makes sense of the spirits in prison, likely being fallen angelic beings, as, as 2 Peter 2 and Jude 6 um, seem to point to. And I think a, a really powerful point is uh, the fact that both uh, Parathes is both found in verse 19 and verse 22, that, that Christ, the Christ went in verse 19 is probably the same journey that he's taking in verse 22. There's the same word there. But the, the biggest hurdle for me to get over with this view, it's not perfect by any means, is the association that um, this view of First Peter seems to take with uh, the pseudepigraphal book of, of Enoch and the Jewish tradition related to it, because um, the the larger Jewish tradition is that there are you know, spirits kept in the heavenlies in prison and that Christ is kind of following in the footsteps of Enoch and proclaiming to them. And it, it makes me uncomfortable to think that Peter is interacting with um, sources like that, that are, are clearly fanciful. But Jude does pretty explicitly draw on the tradition of, of Enoch and, and Peter relates very closely to Jude. And so um, it's not too much of a leap to, to assume that, that Peter's also working with those same sources that Jude's working with. And it, you know, him and him using the interpretation of Enoch does not necessarily validate that literature, but he could just be using the the book of Enoch and, and the tale of the watchers in heaven as kind of an, an example that um, his readers would have been very familiar with. And so um, Peter in, by no means is, is validating what's going on in, in Enoch, but, but nonetheless, that, that is a weakness of the view that, um, it, it does seem to rely on the, that fictional literature. But, um, and anyway, let me, I want to cover verses 21 and 22 quickly. I know that I spend most of my time in my paper and on verses 19 and 20, cause there's so much to talk about there. Um, but there's some interesting stuff happening in verse 21 as well. Uh, verse 21 says baptism corresponds to this it corresponds to what's happening in verse uh verse 20 the word corresponds there is actually the word um antitype so you could translate that verse as saying a baptism is a is a type or an antitype of the flood of no others a typological resemblance or re- redemptive resemblance what's going on there so there's there's a typical typological relationship between the baptism and the great flood. Now, the baptism in this in this instance of a typological relationship is not the pinnacle, like the flood doesn't point to the sign of, of baptism, but rather both the flood and baptism are types or the resemblances of the salvation that we have in Jesus. So both the flood and baptism are connected because they both point us towards the salvation that we have in Christ, which is the ultimate heavenly reality. Those who are united by Jesus, with Jesus by faith are, are spared from the judgment waters of baptism. And the old man who is united to Christ dies in the judgment waters of the flood. And he's, he's raised a new man in the resurrection of Christ. Matthew Poole um, summarizes this really well. He says, so that, that here may be two types, the deliverance of Noah and his household in the flood and baptism, where the former was a type of the latter, yet so as both represent the salvation of the church. So baptism and the flood correspond in the sense that both of those things point ahead 
towards the salvation of the church in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Luther and, and Grudem, or Wayne Grudem, both give um, interesting quotes here. Luther says, but we rest in the ark, which means the Lord Christ or the Christian church, the gospel that Christ preached, the body of Christ on which we rest by faith and are saved as Noah is in the ark. Grudem says, baptism shows us clearly that, clearly that in one sense we have died and been raised again, but in another sense we emerge from that water knowing that we are still alive and have passed through the waters of God's judgment unharmed. As Noah fled into the ark, so we flee to Christ, and in him we escape judgment. So we escape judgment by resting in the ark that is Jesus Christ. He is the ark that we reside in, who delivers us from the, the flood waters of judgment of God. The rest of verse 21, baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism is in some sense salvific, but Peter's not talking about the sign of baptism or the practice of baptism being salvific, but rather he's pointing to the spiritual reality of baptism being uh, what saves you. And this he makes this clear by talking about it's not the cleansing of the skin or removing the dirt from the body that matters, but it's the appeal to God that we have through our spiritual baptism that is what saved us. Noah's family was not saved by the floodwaters per se. They were saved by the ark. And in the same sense, we are not saved by the waters of baptism, but we are saved by the ark that we reside in. And that is Christ. We are united by Christ, to Christ in baptism, and we are spared from God's judgment by, by resting in Christ. And we are raised in Christ to be a new man. Tom Schreiner says, Christ only is the cause and author of eternal salvation. And as those only that were in the ark were saved by water, so those only that are in Christ and that are baptized into Christ and into his death are saved by baptism. Um, the reason that we can have a good conscience from baptism, not, not, not because the sign cleanses our conscience, but we are, our consciences are cleansed. We have good conscience based on the merit of Christ. We know that because we are baptized in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us and his His merit is counted on our behalf. So we, we know that we've been washed and made new by our baptism in Christ. And thus we have a good conscience that we can appeal to God and approach the throne of God boldly based on the access that's been given to us by Jesus Christ. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Uh, the, the ascension of, of Christ to the right hand of God is a, is the right hand is a sign of power. And in the ancient times of being, being at someone's right hand showed that you have, you have penultimate authority. So the, the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of God displays his sovereign rule over the universe. Christ, because he has ascended, he is now in charge his authority is unquestionable over all the spiritual and physical beings in the entire universe. Every spiritual being in the universe must now bow the knee to Jesus because he is the risen king. The spiritual beings here uh, being angels, demons, both good and bad, all of these beings are now subjected to the authority of Christ because he is the king who suffered. He's the king who, who died and resurrected, and he's the king who ascended into the heavens into a position of authority at the right hand of God. And so um, as I conclude here, my thesis statement for the, for the passage holds true. The message of first Peter three, 18 through 22 is that the death resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ has made him victorious over the powers of evil suffering. And Peter wanted to display this truth to his readers so that they would know that the persecutions and the, the sufferings and the trials that they faced are not outside of the control of Christ um, these, these evil powers that are, are, are persecuting them and causing them um, suffering, they will not win, but rather they are already subject to Christ the victor because he has died and rose and ascended into the heavens, and he's done everything that needed to be done to um, reconcile our relationship with God. He's led us back into the presence of the Father. So we have no need to fear uh, the powers of evil in this universe because Christ has established himself as the greatest power by dying and rising and ascending from the dead. So that is my last slide.
if you have any comments or, or questions for me on the presentation, you can turn your mic on and, and ask away, or you can, you can send me a message in the chat. But that is the conclusion of my presentation. We got about five minutes here if there are any comments and questions.